Well, hello and welcome back to our study on prayer. We have spent uh, almost three months on prayer, looking at various passages from the Old and New Testament, mainly from the New Testament. Recently, we looked at a prayer of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. Today's lesson is going to come from Daniel, also in the Old Testament, a lengthy prayer in many respects, uh, a prayer that's very important for the history of Israel, one that was a, a really a benchmark in their history after they had gone into exile. We'll talk more about that in a moment. What I will say, though, is that a couple of years ago, we did a study on Daniel, and this was a lesson in detail and what we would call two different lessons combined into one. I'm going to post in the description a link to that video, but also you'll see it pop up on the screen at the end of our time together today. This is going to be mainly about the prayer and the role of prayer in the life of believers as it relates to the body of believers in general and not just an individual. So I do want you to, to be mindful of that. There will be a much lengthier video that deals with details of the time period, and all of that goes on with chapter 9 that uh, was done a couple years ago. You'll, you'll see that. What I want us to do today, though, is focus on the idea of Daniel's prayer to heal the land. Uh, and the land wasn't necessarily speaking of the actual geographical land, although it was part of that. You'll hear Jerusalem mentioned. It was about the people who were in relationship with God who are now going into exile. What I want to do up front is go ahead and go through the outline first, and then what we'll do is go through the text passage by passage. There won't be a lot of detailed insight other than to kind of highlight some of the things Daniel prayed, what the response was, and at the end we'll talk about some things that we can relate to as we take care to figure out how we're going to apply this text from an ancient time period into modern believers. And then, of course, at the end we'll look at what will be the next and final lesson of this unit before we go into the fall study. Let me go ahead and share with you then the outline that we're going to be looking at. We're going to write up the text into four sections. The first is going to be the setting, and that's going to be verses one through three. Again, this is chapter nine. Um, then you're going to have Daniel's confession on behalf of the nation. And it is Daniel's confession, but it's interesting to note that he's going to be praying for the entire nation. I'll say more about that as well. Then the request specifically that relates after he's made the confession, what are the requests that he makes? And then finally, God's response in verses 20 through 23. So you see the breakdown there, verses 1 to 3, 4 to 14, 15 to 19, and then 20 to 23. Now, what you're going to see is also an epilogue at the end because verses 20 to 23 give a quick reference to the response of God but it moves into another text, and that's where you'll want to go back and watch the video that deals with all of Daniel chapter 9, because there you're going to see all that details with what's going on in the time period, as well as how this is playing out in the life of the people of Israel and Judah. So let me go ahead and get us talking. Um, one of the things we have to recognize is that Daniel, I've always maintained, is an innocent bystander, and yet what he's going to do is he's going to basically identify himself with the people. He recognizes that while he may not have done anything to cause the people of Israel or Judah to go into exile, he is part of that group. And so now as a leader in Babylon, now in Persia, he is now praying on behalf of the nation, as you'll see, as it relates to the historical setting. But what we're seeing here is someone who is identifying with his people. We recently seen, we have recently seen a prayer of Nehemiah where he is worried about the nation after they've gone back and then you also identify Isaiah and others who will recognize that they are a part of the people and therefore they are praying. And the reason I bring all of that up is that there are going to be times when we ourselves have sinned and we identify with all of those have sinned. Other times it may be that we are innocent, but we recognize as being a part of the party, a part of the group, that we bear some kind of responsibility with that. We need to recognize the need of confession as well and then seeking out the mercy of God. Well, what I want to do is go ahead and read each text and then come back and highlight a few aspects of it. So real quickly, Daniel is going to give us the setting in chapter 9, verses 1 to 3. It's very straightforward. There really is only need for one or two comments after that. The text reads, In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. 
So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition and fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. So we see here the setting. All we really need to focus on at this point, of course, is the fact that what Daniel is telling us here is that there has been a time of Babylonian rule. Uh, Darius is a Mede by his father Xerxes, but he is actually ruling among the Persians and they have defeated the Babylonians. Uh, as you read through Daniel, you recognize time passes very quickly as you go from chapter one to chapter nine. This isn't a time period now where Daniel is recognizing that that time period which God had set through Jeremiah for the exile to occur is reaching its conclusion. And in fact, what you're going to find is that there are, uh, by this time, exiles actually going back to Jerusalem and to Judah as well. What you're seeing then is Daniel giving us a timestamp for when these events are occurring. And he also recognizes that he's been paying attention to the scripture. He knew from Jeremiah, particularly what we would call Jeremiah 25, 11 through 13, and Jeremiah 29, 10, that the exile, the deportations that began um, in 605, then in 5, uh, excuse me, 586, 587, and 597, I got those in the uh, wrong order, but 605, 597, and 587, um, and then you see that they're able to return in 539. Somewhere in there, you've got 70 years, depending on which one you reckon. But the point is, Daniel is aware of Jeremiah's word from God that the exile would be 70 years. And of course, what we're going to read in a moment uh, in Daniel's confession is why they were in exile. But it's important to recognize Daniel paying attention to scripture and seeing how it was playing out. He's anticipating now the time of the end of exile, and he brings up prayer to the Father in this regard. One of the things I want us to think about, because it bears on a couple of things that we've studied in the past, is the fact that here he pleads with God in prayer, the idea of seeking and reaching out to God in a continuous basis, and of course with an attitude longing for God to hear. He raises petitions, and of course he's going to make requests here pretty soon, and then notice what he also does like Nehemiah did, he went into a time of fasting. And we don't know all that he fasted. We don't know how long he fasted, just that he fasted. And then he put on sackcloth and acid, ashes, which is typically the posture of repentance and remorse and confession, but also mourning. The idea there that he is mourning over his sin. As I've said, he is a, an innocent bystander. God has blessed him in leadership among his uh, captors. And yet he recognizes that he's still a part of the Jewish people. And as a result, he's reflecting upon what they've endured as a result of God's punishment for their lack of faithfulness to his covenant. We'll see that in a moment. So the setting here, Daniel uh, praying because he's aware of the time that God had set through Jeremiah about the ending of the exile. Good news is there, there's time to go back, but there's also the need to reflect on why they were in exile to begin with. And so what Daniel does is offers up a prayer referencing all of that. So let's go ahead and read that. We're going to be looking at Daniel's confession on behalf of the nation, chapter 9, verses 4 through 14. The prayer will extend all the way into 19, but we'll read 4 through 14. So he says this, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and love of, of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you, we and our kings, our princes, and our ancestors are covered with shame, Lord, because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing on us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like this, what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us 
Yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord, our God, by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster on us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Well, there's a little bit of repetition in there in terms of the sin that they've committed, in terms of the covenant that they've broken, also in terms of the magnitude that this would be the whole people, wherever they are. Well, in verse four, we see that God is described. Notice as many of the prayers begin in the in the Bible, there's a reference to who God is in relationship to the people. Here, he's described as great and awesome. And I think we need to take a moment just to reflect upon the fact that great and awesome are not being used in the ways that we would often use them today. We like to call something awesome that's really just mediocre when it's compared to God. He is one who strikes all in us. He is great. He's not just um, someone who is um, something we look up to. He's great in magnitude and worthy of our praise. So we see how big he is, if you will. We see what he is deserving of in terms of praise and honor and glory. He is one who we should be in awe of. Then he also goes on to describe relationally who God is. He says, you are the keeper of the covenant of love. First, he calls him Lord, Yahweh. He is the one who is the I am. Then he is the great God, an awesome God. What does he do? He is a loving God. He keeps his covenant of love. And of course, that covenant of love is kept to those who love him and keep his commandments. And as you read through the book of Exodus, and even as you read Jesus' own words, to love Jesus is to keep his commandments, to obey the things that he has taught. That same principle is here. God loves those who will love him and keep his commandments. Now, of course, we know he loves all the world, but here the idea of covenant is in play. And therefore, as he has made covenant with one, he keeps that covenant with the one who will keep his covenant. The reason they're in exile, even now, as Daniel has said in the confession, is they've not kept that covenant. So what we have here then is a description of who God is, setting up an acknowledgement that God does keep covenant, but then turns it right around and offers a multi-level set of confessions that we'll see in the next few verses. Just to reset this then, what does he confess? He uses some generic terms for sin, general terms, and he also gets into some specifics at this point as well. Notice the various ways he's done this. The NIV is going to be rendering it this way. Uh, you're going to find different renderings that are parallel or synonymous in other translations. But he, he speaks in general terms. He says we have sinned. We have done wrong. We have been wicked. We have rebelled. Each of those has a different layer to it as well. Speaking in many ways from a general reference to a more specific, the idea of being wicked is in terms of relationship of what God has instructed them, rebelled, of course, against the covenant. But then he goes on to talk about this in the rest of five and six. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to the prophets. What Daniel is pointing out here is that he is one of those exilic prophets. In other words, he is a prophet, if you will. He wasn't technically a prophet, but his, his time period was during the exile and near the end of the exile. What he's then recounting is the fact that when Israel first goes into exile under the Assyrians, they had many, many opportunities to listen to the prophets, and they failed to do so. The Jews that are in exile now, coming from the southern kingdom of Judah, had many, many centuries to hear the prophets, and they failed. And so what Daniel is acknowledging is that they didn't listen to Isaiah. They didn't listen to Jeremiah. They didn't listen to Hosea. They didn't listen to Micah. And the list goes on and on and on about the fact that they have failed to keep uh, covenant and also failed to take correction and take the opportunity that was given them to turn back to God when the prophets were speaking on behalf of God. The prophets were God's servants in order to bring them back to covenant. And one of the things they find themselves is in exile because they haven't kept the covenant and various aspects of the covenant and what that would look like. What we have then further is the result. There is an acknowledgement of shame. Now, covering with shame here is not them feeling shame, but recognizing that in a, in a more literal way, they are shame. They are under shame because of what they have done. They have been exposed. Their sin has exposed them as being in conflict with God's covenant. So again, the result is they're covered in shame. Now, we want to keep that in mind because what Daniel's doing essentially then is speaking in terms of a godly remorse. There is a certain kind of remorse, or, or um, remorse is a word, confession, there's a mourning for your sin. Uh, there is a kind of repentance 
that is godly that leads to a kind of re restoration as we'll see in a moment but their shame it's not an imposed shame it's an acknowledgement that what they've done is their actions have brought shame on them in the sight of god and it's comprehensive daniel doesn't leave anyone out he says judah which is the southern kingdom jerusalem which is the city the capital city but also referencing the the, 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 the temple, the footstool of God, if you will. He then goes on to talk about all Israel. At this point, it may just be covenant language for Israel. He may be also reaching back into the uh, northern kingdom as well. But then he goes on to say that they are um, everywhere scattered. We have been um, faithless. We have been unfaithful. He says everywhere they are scattered. Now, by the time the Assyrians take the northern kingdom away and they never come back, the Jews of the southern kingdom go out in different places, and Daniel is himself in exile. He's acknowledging that God is scattered or has scattered them throughout, and he's wanting to pray on behalf of all of them. He then goes on to talk about all levels of leadership. He talks about the kings and princes and so forth. He'll do that twice, here and then later in the prayer. He repeats this phrase, they are covered in shame. And then he makes one final statement where he started. We have sinned against you. He's acknowledging that the reason they're in exile is because they have sinned against God. He's saying this all the while knowing that the time of the end of exile has occurred. Cyrus was the first king of Persia that defeated the Babylonians. And a year after he defeated the Babylonians, he set a decree in 538 to allow those Jews that were in exile to return. Daniel comes a little bit later. I know there's a little bit of a debate about the relationship of Cyrus and, and Darius, but the point here is that Daniel is speaking at a time when exiles have returned. So there are those that are back in Jerusalem and Judah, but there are still many that are scattered in other places. He's gathering them all up in this place, in this prayer, saying, all of us have sinned. Along the way then, reading further into the text, he says that he is reminded of God's mercy and forgiveness. He speaks back to God that he is a God of mercy and forgiveness. Despite the rebellion of the people and the fact that they have not obeyed the Lord their God or kept the laws that he gave through the prophets, again, a reference to God's attempt over and over again to reconcile themselves to himself, or re reconcile them to himself, they have not listened. They know that the, the message of the prophets, while a word of condemnation, offered also a word of restoration if they would heed the warning that the prophets gave. God was merciful and forgiving if they would have taken him and taken him up on the offer of repenting. They, they didn't. And so they find themselves in exile. Verse 11a, then he comes back right again and repeats the problem. All Israel has transgressed your law. They have turned away. They have refused to obey. So this is an active attitude of rebellion. Not only have they broken the law, they are turning away, not even paying attention to the law, refusing to obey. As a result, Daniel can acknowledge the outcome in verse 11b. Judgment has come due to the sin, and that judgment has been carried out. He acknowledges that where he is today is because of what the Jews had done in not being faithful to the covenant. And he is a part of that. Even if he is, as I maintain, an innocent bystander, he is still participating and identifying with the sin of the people. Then what you find in chapter 9, verses 12 to 14 is a final acknowledgement. He says, God will do what he said he would do. He's saying, you have done and fulfilled all that you said you would do. This goes back to Moses, as Daniel said. God gave the covenant through Moses, gave instructions to obey it, but warned that if there was disobedience, there would be various kinds of curses and condemnation and judgment on that. Reflecting upon all of that history from the time of Moses into the time of of Israel and Judah, the divided kingdom, you now find an acknowledgement that God has completed all that he said he would do. So we find ourselves here in a time of confession, acknowledging all that the, the people had done against God and that God has exacted judgment. Now, Daniel's not saying anything to God that God doesn't already know, but it's very important for Daniel to acknowledge that to God as he participates in the confession and identifies with the people in confession. And, and I think that can be an important example for us as well. We recognize the mercy and forgiveness of God. That should prompt us to seeking uh, confession and repentance. After he's gone through acknowledging who God is, acknowledging the sin that they've committed, recognizing God is merciful and forgiving, recognizing that God has carried out the judgment that he said he would, 
he now makes a request. And so let's look at verses 15 through 19, Daniel's actual request. Now, Lord, our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned. We have done wrong. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For, you, for your sake, my God, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. So what is he doing here? He does make an actual request. Let's look at those really quickly. First, um, what he does as he goes through is he again acknowledges the sin. He's asking God to hear. And this is the main issue. Turn away your wrath. Turn away your anger. Judgment has come. And now he's saying, you've acknowledged that time is over. Jeremiah has said the time is over. Now fulfill that part of the covenant. You fulfilled the covenant in terms of the punishment that would come upon us for not obeying. Now, as you have covenanted with through Jeremiah to make this only last 70 years, now turn away your wrath, turn away your anger. He then says in the opposite direction, look on with favor at the desolate sanctuary. He talks about Jerusalem. He talks about the, the area of Judah. He talks specifically about the Holy Hill, that sanctuary, which had been destroyed because of their sin. He's looking at requesting that God see and remember, and then he would bring restoration to that. Verse 18, part B, he acknowledges that there's no reason God has to give any of this if he doesn't want to. They certainly aren't righteous enough to ask God for this. They are again laying themselves at the mercy of God. Daniel, as he's brought up earlier that God is a God of mercy, he is now asking God on the basis of that mercy to bring about a renewal. And so what he's doing is he's acknowledging, I've already said we've, we've sinned, we've disobeyed, we've been unfaithful, we've broken the covenant. Clearly, it's not because of our righteousness that we're going to make this petition. It's because you are merciful. And because of that, he can make that petition. And then notice again what he says in verse 19. Listen, forgive, hear, and act. Now, those are parallel statements. And so while this is not uh, poetic form, there is some Hebrew parallelism here where he's basically saying the same thing in two different ways, listening and hearing, forgiving and acting. Of course, the acting would be that act of forgiveness. Again, he acknowledges that it's not because of anything that they have done. It's not because they're righteous. He says, for your sake, do this. You remember perhaps um, Moses appealing to God when God wanted to destroy the people in the wilderness because of their sin. And what Moses said is, think about your name and the reputation you have among the nations. What would the nations say about you if they look back and they say, wow, their God brought them out and then he destroyed them? What would be the reputation? Daniel's doing something similar here. For your name's sake, for your sake, keeping covenant and keeping consistent with who you say you are. He then makes that appeal. He says, for your sake, do this. Do this on behalf of who you are and because of your character keeping your promise to punish, but now keeping your, com your promise to restore. He says then, don't delay. Don't delay. While the people of Jerusalem, Judah, and all the surrounding areas, and if, as they are scattered, he said, um, bear your name. He says, now do it. The city and the people, bear your name. Do it for them. And so again, that call and that request. We then have the response. You have in verses 20 to 23, the response. Now, the response is actually prelude to something else that's going to happen. And I'll give that as an epilogue. But it's important to recognize the speed with which this prayer is being answered. Verses 20 to 23. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to you uh, to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, a word went out, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. 
Now he's about to give them a vision of the 70 70s, um, the 77s, excuse me. We'll talk about that in our epilogue in a moment. The point that's being made here with reference to the prayer is that Daniel had been interpreting, re receiving other visions and the reinterpretations of those as he's seeing what God is going to be doing in the coming days, uh, both in terms of who the Jews are and in other nations. But what we're going to see here is another vision that comes about. And that vision is actually in response to the prayer of Daniel. So we'll read that as a part of an epilogue in a moment. But it's important to recognize this. God had already had a plan to answer Daniel's prayer. And in this case, it was the Archangel Michael coming to give him a vision about what's going to take place in response to that prayer. Now, what we're going to see in a moment is that it's a, uh, a fulfillment that's going to occur both immediately and in the future. And so we'll see that. But we, we recognize that God has a plan of restoration here. So what we're seeing here is God responding, listening to the prayer, and Gabriel giving a word of comfort and encouragement and acknowledgement. Even as you were praying, God has sent me a word to you that will give you insight and understanding. And so we see there God ready to do this. Now, he's ready to act. As we said, part of this fulfillment we're going to read in a moment will take place very shortly in their future. But then Daniel, or Gabriel is going to give word to Daniel about something that goes even further into the future, both to the first and seemingly the second coming of the Messiah. So I want to read that to you. But the key, and I want you to think about right now before we read that, is that as Daniel has acknowledged the sin of the people, as he has laid himself at the mercy of God, as he has appealed to God on behalf of his name, and he is seeking that restoration, and God fulfilling the second part of that covenant of restoration, Gabriel appears and says, God has heard, we have a word for you. Well, let me give you that epilogue because I think it's important. I won't give a lot of explanation. I'll just say what I've said a second ago. And that is God has a plan of restoration, both immediate for them, and that will take place in the future as well on a more cosmic level, if you will. Notice then in verses 24 through uh, 27, it's three verses, but they're long. So bear with me. He says this, Gabriel says to Daniel, 77s are decreed for your people and your holy city in, uh, to finish transgressions, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So there is a time for that. There will be restoration. But even in the, top, in the topic of that restoration here, when the finishing of the transgression occurs, there's even a reference there to what can only be something fulfilled in the far future. Verse 25, he says, know and understand this from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. At the, and at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Well, a couple of things here, as we said already, some things that will take place in the immediate future, then some things that are going to take place between the return and rebuilding of the temple to the time of Messiah. And then Daniel even gives us a bit of a hint, or through Gabriel does to Daniel, of something in the future. In short, it demonstrates that God has a plan. He's thinking about not only his own people, but he's thinking about the world in, in general at this point. God is offering up a plan for Daniel and the people of God, the Jews, as well as those who would be, be believers in Messiah in the time of the future. We've had then Daniel's confession, his request, and the response. And with our epilogue, we see that God does have a plan. We're in the midst of that plan. What Daniel has talked about with regard to the 77s, some will say that leads up to the time of Messiah specifically. Some will say that it goes beyond that, even into the time of the end. And I think there's a little bit of both in there. But what do we do with this text? It's a text that was given a long time ago. It was given in a time of exile of the Jews. And here we are as followers of Jesus. What do we make of this text for our own application? Yes, Daniel prays on behalf of the people of Judah and Israel, Israel being maybe covenant language at that point. Maybe he's thinking in terms of the northern kingdom of Israel. We have a number of the prophets 
prophesying like Ezekiel about the reunion of Judah and Israel, which hasn't taken place yet. But they are representative of people who are in relationship with God. We as followers of Christ today also are followers of God. We make, we make up the people of God. We're not a nation in the sense that the Jews were a nation in the Old Testament. But we are a holy nation, if you will, as we find Peter saying of believers in Christ. We do join in that terminology. Paul uses similar language in e Ephesians chapter 2. We're not a nation, nor are we confined to a singular nation. If there's one parallel that very much bears um, a consistency with who we are today, while we are scattered for different reasons and not because of judgment, the fact of the matter is God's people are scattered throughout the globe. So we're not a nation in that sense, but we are a part of the kingdom of God as participants in the kingdom of God. So what do we do as those scattered? Well, we can ask ourselves a couple of questions. How are the sins of the people of God today the same as those that Daniel confessed? Now, we as the believers in Christ should be different. Um, that should be borne out in the way we conduct ourselves in relationship with one another. It should be borne out in the way we conduct ourselves with other people. Well, the question is, though, the way that Daniel is confessing the brokenness of that relationship through the breaking of the covenant, what are some ways today that we can say that we are having a problem with that? I'm thinking of us individually. I'm thinking of us collectively as a local body of believers as well as a, a global body of believers. What is it that we need to take from this prayer that helps us to think about our own reflection and our relationship with God? We go through times of disobedience. We go through times of rebellion. Uh, if we are truly believers, though, we'll have the Holy Spirit to prick our conscience and draw us back. But what do we do? We need to do the same thing that Daniel has done, and that is to confess. And we'll read 1 John 1, 9 in a moment. But the point is that just as there was sin back then, we sin, and that sometimes that sin is not only individual, it's corporate. In other words, the groups of people have committed this sin. There are a lot of things going on nationwide in the United States and a lot of things going on around the world that identify as believers, but people that identify as believers, but are not providing a good witness of what it means to be a follower of Christ. What must believers then, as the people of God today, what, what, what must we confess? I want us to think about that. One thing that's been on my mind for a long time is the lack of unity that believers are to have in relationship to the fact that we are, in, um, in, we are united in God, we are united in Christ. Why does that not bear itself out in the way we conduct ourselves in relationship to one another? We lack unity in many respects. Jesus prayed that we be one as he is one with the Father. How have we not placed God first? One of the things that we see in the covenant broken in the Old Testament is that they worshiped idols. Now, Daniel doesn't say that specifically, but he does talk about openly disobeying and rebelling. But clearly part of that was idolatry. And there may be some things that we consider idolatry today that we don't put God first. And so the question might be, what idols are we placing before God? One of the things that the prophets often um, criticized and critiqued and judged the people for was not keeping covenant. And what did that covenant look like? That covenant looked like this, as Micah 6, 8 said, to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before God. It meant loving God and loving others. In what ways are we not doing that, that we need to confess that? We can pray uh, for help remaining faithful, so we can be preemptive in our prayers. Lord, help me to remain faithful. Help me to learn from the mistakes of the past. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 10, that the things that were happening in the Old Testament were written for us as an example for us to instruct us. In other words, we can learn from others' mistakes, and I think that's important for us to do. So we can be thinking about Daniel as he prays in the past about what we need to consider for the future and our present. Also, in conclusion, we can have confidence that upon our confession, there is restoration. Gabriel spoke a word to Daniel that God had a plan once the people came to a point of confession. God fulfilled his part of judgment and was bringing them back to restoration. And it, it was Daniel in many ways reflecting that by praying the prayer of confession. For our, so ourselves individually, we can think of this. Even as God has a plan to forgive sin upon confession, John in 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. Sometimes it'll be translated righteousness. He's faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and cleanse us from every unrighteousness. Uh, it's important that we do that. Uh, it's important that we acknowledge where we have fallen short. When we do, we know that God is seeking to restore us. Fortunately, those of us who are in Christ don't worry, so to speak, about losing that covenant 
But we need to recognize that while we are saved, there is a need for that renewal of covenant. There's a renewal of that relationship. Uh, many in certain um, Christian circles will talk about rededicating our lives. And we see the rededication in the Old Testament time and time again from generation to generation. I think we need to do that as well. We've looked at Daniel's prayer and we recognize that there are going to be times we as a people need to be praying um, for forgiveness and seeking to confess our sin so that God can then make us useful again. I hope that uh, you'll be with me next week as we go through one final prayer. We're going to be looking at 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15. The title of the lesson is going to be Praying with Confidence. We're going to be noting that we pray in accordance with God's will. He will hear us. There's much more that we can study about prayer. We'll make a comment or two after the next lesson. But it's important that we recognize that what we've done in these 12 lessons and then the 13th lesson to come does not cover everything there is to know about prayer, all that we need to pray, how we are to pray, what attitudes to pray. If anything, it would enjoin us to go back and read the prayers of the Bible and notice what we're to pray about. And I hope that you will be spurred on to do that. Let's have a word of prayer before we conclude, and then we'll have our blessing. Father, we thank you for Daniel, who, though he himself was not guilty of the things that he confessed, uh, much like Isaiah, uh, we thank you for his example of identifying with his people. He recognized that being in covenant with you was not just an individual relationship with you, but it was a corporate relationship among the people. And he finds himself in exile because of the sins of the people. I thank you that he was humble enough to confess. I thank you that you had a word for him to not only plan the restoration of the, the people back into the land, but also looking forward to a time when you're going to make all things new. We thank you for our part in being able to see the fulfillment of the coming of Messiah in Jesus Christ, who now works to provide intercession for us through the Holy Spirit interceding with words for us, that we now can live in, in, in close contact with you as our Father because of the work of Jesus on the cross. We also anticipate the time of the end when you will make all things new. In the meantime, Father, I pray you help us to be reflective upon our relationship with you and what that looks like from day to day. We want to honor you and bless you. You're a good God. And just as Daniel prayed, you are a great and awesome God. You are a merciful God and a forgiving God. And we are so thankful that we can come to you to confess our sin so that we can re repent and in that repentance be made um, clean and new again. We love you and praise you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have one more lesson, as I said. And uh, until that lesson, as always, I pray that you will be well and that you will be blessed.